Good morning. My name is Tom Porter. I work with UNICEF USA, and um, it's my pleasure to represent an organization that works to reach the most vulnerable children in 190 countries um, in this conversation on global efforts in pediatric innovation. And we have a truly uh, global panel here and represented in small form. But uh, I'll go through quick introductions, and they're going to tell you a bit about their work, and then we'll have some time for questions as well. So first off, Fran A. And Fran, I'll let you, you've been so kind. Let, just give me, your last name is A. Um, and <laughs> if you, if you, those that are uh, more skilled can attempt later. Um, Fran is the head of uh, population, or excuse me, health uh, at H, or head of population health at HP, uh, where she is focused on addressing persistent challenges in healthcare with innovation. Uh, she's an epidemiologist by training. Um, next to her is Kristen Mallory of Children International. She's a program officer there, and she manages a portfolio of health programs um, across the world in 13 different agencies in 10 countries. And to my left here, Alberto, Dr. Alberto Tozzi, Chief Innovation Officer at the Research Hospital for Pediatrics at Bambino in Rome. And so please uh, welcome our panelists. Um, so, Fran, I will turn it over to you, and I believe I have a slide here that I can advance. One slide. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, and for those who are curious, the name is Fran Ayala Somayajla, and I am the head of global healthcare at HP. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, I wanted to kind of uh, focus in this conversation on the opportunities with technology and how we see it really being introduced across the world globally in very positive ways. Um, when, during our opening keynote, one of the things that was spoken about was the possibility uh, of what could come with the adoption of technology and how so many markets are adopting things like mobile technology. It's important to note and be aware that there are more people with mobile devices than there are people with drinking water. And when we ex evaluate or, or survey uh, consumers around the globe, um, what we find is that they believe that technology is really going to be instrumental in terms of their lifelong well-being. And with that then, we spend our time really dedicated to focusing on where those opportunities exist. Not only um, when it comes to delivering technologies in the hands of clinicians, but equally those technologies being placed in the hands of the patients as well. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing this move from the notion of continuing, the continuum of care, really meaning placing technology in the hands of patients and in multiple ways. But I'm gonna give you some examples of these on both ends from a clinical aspect, as well as how this translates into the adoption and the utilization of technology from a patient perspective, the healthcare consumer and their personal caregivers. The first of which is to uh, note some of the advances that we're making in areas like immersive compute technology. And some examples of this are the use of holographic imaging, um, which is enabling us to do things such as conduct 17-hour surgeries of conjoined twins in reduced amounts of time because the clinicians are able to prep for these, uh, these surgeries in advance and not with handmade drawings and illustrations, but actually being able to use the MRI data, that is the 20 terabytes on average of data that exists within a hospital in more intelligent ways. Or when it comes to orthopedics as an example, being able to utilize 3D print technology to be able to create for more customized, personalized creation of devices, and not even necessarily having to take that off-site to be produced, but can actually be reproduced within the basement of a facility. Or when it comes to a patient's own experience within an environment, recognizing that the sterile environment that we're so accustomed to may not be the most inviting for patients, and that it results in patients feeling clinically depressed, and also having negative results of post-surgery. And that when we transform those environments, we're actually able to improve uh, the outcomes for a patient's post-surgery. And we're able to actually reduce the amount of clinical depression amongst young, uh, young adult uh, uh, oncology patients, as an example. 
or when it comes to the area of virtual reality, um, the ability for us to apply VR technology for things like pain management becomes amazingly powerful. And so much so that in the face of the opioid crisis, we've able to, to achieve a 20% reduction in the use of opioids amongst chronic pain patients. And now we're seeing in pediatrics, anesthesiologists actually applying this technology in their practices as well. The one thing that uh, you didn't see on that screen, which quite frankly is not uh, typically visible, is that the technology that is making the most profound impact and will continue to is the adoption of connected technology. The sensors that are embedded into wearable devices or even 3D printed prosthetic devices, which should not only tell you whether or not a patient is wearing it, but also letting you know the patient's temperature, uh, letting you know whether or not there's an increased risk for um, infection. So these are the types of things that we're working on. And this is driven by the needs of both the patients as well as clinicians. And we are re really looking forward to continue to our pursuits in, the, in addressing these persistent challenges. And I, I'm now out of time, so I'd like for you to please um, ask some questions because I do have some great stories that I'd love to be able to share with you. But in the interest of time, we'll pass it over to my colleagues. And who is next? Hello, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here and an honor to be part of these exciting conversations around innovation and how we can use innovation, innovation to support children. Um, I'd like to tell a story, can we go back a slide? Or introduce you to Rena. Rena is a mother of two children living in a vulnerable community in Kolkata, India. She has one of her daughters is under, Aditi is the name, um, is underweight for her age and like many of us in the room, can I get a show of hands of mothers out there? Yeah, so as many of us as mothers in the room, Rena wants to give her children a fighting chance, not only to survive, but to thrive as they grow into adulthood. Next. Children International. It's an or, a nonprofit organization um, based in Kansas City, actually, and working in 10 countries across the Americas, Asia, and Africa. We aim to break the cycle of poverty by investing in children and youth through a holistic approach that focuses on health, education, youth empowerment, and employment. Poverty is a pretty complex issue, and for that reason, we have to embrace a culture of innovation. We are always learning because the circumstances where we work are continuously changing. We must listen, reflect, and be able to adapt quickly in order to um, meet the needs of the people who we're trying to serve and partner with them to find better solutions. So about a year ago, when Sally Gasaraga from Children's Mercy in their innovations department in Kansas City reached out to us about an innovative tool that had been developed at the hospital, we were really interested and intrigued to see how we could, could leverage this innovation to meet our needs. So that, oh, thank you. So the device um, was a upper, well, an armband that could be used to measure middle upper arm circumference, as many of you are familiar with MUAC, but specifically Z-scores related to MUAC, which was something novel, for children two to 18 years old. This simple to use paper device tool was developed by Dr. Susan Abel Raman, who is a clinician and also researcher at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. This tool had proven to be quite effective um, to screen for malnutrition with dietitians in a US-based hospital setting. So we were interested to see how it would translate to a global, more resource-limited setting. A, quick, a couple quick stats on global nutrition from the 2018 Nutrition Report. Although progress has been made over the past decade, there's still a lot more to do. Um, currently, there are still over 150 million children under five who are stunted and over 50 million children who are wasted. There's an emerging group of children who are overweight, which we're very aware. And the burden of, the, of this is felt a lot more deeply in developing countries where oftentimes health systems are struggling to keep up with the growing demands of their citizens, particularly those living in poverty. 
Children International seeks to fill the gaps in the health systems where we work, and one way that we do this is through our nutrition rehabilitation program that identifies and supports children who are acutely malnourished under 12. Some of the challenges we face through this program are timely detection of cases and then also meaningful engagement of parents in the rehabilitation process. So we decided to test the feasibility of this new MUAC Z-score tape um, to address these challenges through two different experiments. One was in Guatemala by equipping community volunteers with the tape in order to screen for malnutrition. And then the second was in Kolkata. The aim was to empower mothers whose children were already in our nutrition program to use the tape to monitor the children's growth at home in order to engage them more fully in the recovery of their children. And we found some exciting results. Through two, experiment, two leading experiments in Guatemala, 224 volunteers were trained who were able to screen almost 1,400 children. And we found that not only could volunteers effectively use the tape, but it also was a much more effective at screening than BMI, which had been our typical measurement for detection. BMI was multi-step, required equipment and calculations, where the MUAC Z-score tape condensed this to one simple step, providing immediate feedback to both the screener and the screenee. And volunteers also voiced um, their satisfaction in be, being able to contribute to their community in this way. In Kolkata, we did a study of two months involving 37 families, 17 of which were in the experiment group, who learned how to use the MUAC Z-score tape. They took it home to monitor their children with instructions to monitor once a week for two months. Over that two-month period, 88% of the mothers who used the tape said that they were satisfied with the tape and it was helpful in making decisions around their, their child's health. Um, and we also saw some really positive trends for actual weight improvement of children whose mothers were using the MUAC tape at home. We're currently doing a larger, um, longer study to see if this trend holds true. So overall, through a participatory and lean approach to testing, we see great potential in this tool. We're currently sharing knowledge with the rest of our global teams for potential scale up. And I wanted to end this story with a couple pictures of Rena and her child participating in the experiment. The MUAC Z-score tape turned something that's really complex like malnutrition, reduced it to something understandable, accessible, and ultimately something that could be changed. The tape put power into Rena's hands, the hands of mothers, the hands of communities, in order to transform them from passive participants to active drivers of change for the well-being of their children. Thank you. What about Europe? Uh, actually, uh, Europe is a strange place. Uh, Innovation is uh, very slowly increasing, and uh, being a chief innovation officer in Europe is really tough. I would say that I'm one of the three or four people with this role in Europe, you know, in hospitals, in pediatric hospitals. And uh, uh, the challenge is how to uh, uh, get better and to make people and uh, hospital staff understand that this is crucial to improve the, the quality of care and the uh, uh, health of, of children, actually. So, um, one of the reasons why I became a Chief innovation, innovation Officer is because of this conference. Because about two years ago, after one of these conferences, I came back from California to Italy, and I was pushing so much for having some space, some room for innovation, that they decided to give me this role, which was very fortunate. <laughs> so, I spy is a little bit guilty about that. Uh, but after that, we decided to start um, increasing the knowledge about the methods for innovation, how to uh, apply some classical things that in the U.S. are very popular, that in each, in every single hospital in the U.S. <clears throat> in U.S., I've been um, meeting people with a big enthusiasm, uh, uh, applying technology, a lot of technology in their hands and other things. So we started making meetings courses, all these things that uh, were 
uh, instrumental to increase the interest of health uh, uh, the, of the personnel uh, of the hospital. We brought food for attracting more people in the meeting. We streamed through the web and so on. And uh, slowly, we increased to a sufficient number of people that now are engaged in innovation. But one of the lessons that we learned is that innovation is not about technology, but it's about people. And two stories demonstrate very well, at least in our case. One is uh, the story of a, uh, a guy. Uh, this guy, his name is Luca. And actually, Luca came to my office uh, one day because he was very passionate about 3D printing. And he said, well, uh, I would like to collaborate with you because I, uh, I like very much uh, designing 3D models and trying to make this for a hospital would be, uh, would be a, absolutely fantastic for me. And after this, uh, he confessed that actually he was an architect. And he said, I never heard that an architect uh, play this role in a hospital, and I don't know if this is possible in this case. And I said, okay, let's go. Um, we hired Luca for six months, and in six months, uh, Luca actually put together a team with surgeons and uh, radiologists, and uh, they are now planning every single complex surgery with this uh, approach. And uh, the advantage is having somebody in the hospital uh, working with segmentation together with radiologists and surgeons, which makes a big, big difference. For example, uh, this is one of the four interventions for separation of conjoined twins. And uh, the output of this uh, simulation and preparation was uh, nearly 50% of the time in the operating room. Predicted was 18 hours, we spent at least uh, about 10. And this was one of the stories. The second one is about uh, uh, a parent. Uh, you know, one of the uh, obsessions of uh, innovation officers is trying to bring artificial intelligence in the, the hospital. Uh, we made a lot of courses about that. and. Uh, uh, during one of these courses about artificial intelligence, we invited one parent because this parent is the, as a child, a sick child uh, with a severe cardiac malformation. Uh, and he brought and told his experience from his point of view. After this course, this parent decided to have a PhD in data science and decided to ask for having a study for predicting severe events uh, in the uh, ICU. So it's very important that this two story demonstrates that there's nothing planned that uh, would have been reaching this result. And only because uh, we were open to receive inputs from outside, uh, we, uh, we were uh, able to uh, create a group for uh, planning surgery and possibly another group uh, with a parent in, uh, uh, participating in the same activity for planning uh, uh, for studying a prediction of severe events uh, in intensive care unit. Let me tell that uh, the real challenge, uh, I don't know if you uh, um, see this slide, is that once you realize that you can do that, one of the problems is trying to uh, have a systematic approach uh, in innovation because we are very good at research programs and this is common to all hospitals in Europe. We are less good at trying to uh, bring the innovation to the market. So if you look at these stages in the uh, uh, development of an innovation, we usually stop at one of the first two uh, icons, uh, the first two steps. We need an ecosystem to do that. We need different stakeholders. And what we're trying to do right now is trying to bring all them together. And I think this is one of the most difficult activities that um, we have uh, to accomplish, not only in our hospital, but in all over Europe, because we are, again, not used to uh, have this interdisciplinary approach, and we're not used to bring products to the market. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Um, let's see, I wanna just follow up on that. You mentioned where you're having to build an, an ecosystem. Um, what, what were some of the, or what are some of the challenges that you're facing now? What's, what are some of the biggest hurdles uh, to building that ecosystem? 
Well, the simple things are that uh, we are doctors, pediatricians. We don't know anything about regulation, business, risk management. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we, we Europeans uh, have to do with uh, have to deal with GDPR, for example, which is pretty much uh, uh, more difficult than uh, HIPAA. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we don't know how to approach uh, risk in investment, for example, which is very uh, important to decision makers. Uh, one of the usual stories is that I go to my boss and I say, we have got to invest in this activity because this is uh, extremely important. And he say, we must be very prudent because uh, we better wait and look for the others and wait for the others to, uh, applying this uh, the same technology or the same innovation. This is the biggest mistake that I can uh, uh, actually uh, tell you uh, that happens very frequently in Europe. And the approach to risk management is so different that this makes a very big difference uh, when I compare our activity to what happens in the US. I would say that this is a problem. The other problem is um, funding, because um, most of the times we are using research funds for uh, uh, supporting innovation. We're not, uh, uh, we have not a lot of access to uh, innovation funds uh, because uh, for one, one reason is that there are not many and Europe is not uh, letting uh, a hospital access this kind of uh, funds. Two, uh, hospitals are not uh, very likely to offer support to innovation. They're pretty much more likely to uh, fund research than innovation. And this is the second problem that we have. Thank you. And uh, Kristen, in terms of that ecosystem, I know Children's International um, works very closely with the communities that they serve to implement innovation. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So over the past two years, Children International has really invested um, in an innovative culture, um, starting with our staff in the field. So. Um, building both the capabilities but also the mindset around innovation. So testing, we've used a discipline approach through lean experiments, um, something simple, six to eight week experiments, not a lot of resources, not a lot of human resources in order to fail quickly, learn often. Um, and so pulling the communities into this process with our staff in the field has been um, definitely something that we've been prioritizing over the past year, um, realizing that there's essential feedback um, that leads to better solutions. So when I think someone in the last panel had mentioned partnership, partners in design, very much seeing the community and partners in design from the beginning plans of experiments um, into the final solutions. Thank you. And Fran, I'll just ask you too, as two, having two epidemiologists on stage, what drove you personally to get into innovation? trying to find ways to solve persistent problems. I mean, we see the statistics all the time, right? We work with the data and we work directly with the patients as well, um, whether that's um, you know, within hospital settings or within the field. And what the real you know, opportunity is, is to try to address those issues. Today, I mostly am you know, focused in on non-communicable diseases. Um, and with that then, there are a lot of things that can be addressed by the adoption of technology. And really focusing in on trying to find simplistic ways to go about that is where we see you know, huge opportunity. And there, there really is, I want to piggyback on what Alberto was talking about in terms of challenges. We equally share the same kinds of challenges here. The question that always comes out is who's going to pay for it? So you have to be really smart about those applications. So for example, if you're looking at the adoption of virtual reality technology, well, incorporating biofeedback um, into those sessions is one way that we go about creating for billable VR. Um, so you know, it's, it's just really trying to you know, address those challenges that really you know, drove me in that direction. If you're already working with the data, um, start leveraging. It's not enough to say that we're, you know, we're getting 50% you know, improvement, or we're getting, we're able to use 10% of the data that's available to us when we could be really leveraging it all when we access things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Can I, can I tell one more word about the role of, it, of epidemiologists? Actually, we are in the position also to apply evidence and epidemiology to uh, demonstrate that actually technology really works. And this is something that we miss a lot. 
Fantastic. Well, I think we do have to wrap it up there. We're out of time. Um, so please give a round of applause for our panelists. And I would encourage you to, um, to seek out our panelists later today to continue the conversation. Thank you.